Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here in this beautiful location with you all. Um, so yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, so today we will be, you know, covering now, doing some intro, moving into methods, and then we'll have a hands-on session later. And the focus of a lot of what I'll be talking about is, you know, in the context of this workshop, how do we use uh, AI, and in particular, what I'll talk about mostly is deep learning as a way of um, building insights into neural computation and thinking about how we can interpret what populations of neurons in the brain are doing. And so I'm fortunate to follow after Chathan's lecture where he introduced a number of concepts that I'll be kind of piggybacking off of. Um, and so the beginning will be a little, perhaps, um, bit of a... Uh, similar, perhaps in motivation to what you saw yesterday, but I just want to kind of set the stage for a lot of the methodologies that I'll be discussing in more detail. So um, in terms of what are the kind of general questions and what are we after, right? In, in a lot of um, neuroscience and, you know, computation of neural data, we're interested in, you know, taking activity from the brain in this case, I'm gonna be talking about, you know, spiking or firing activity of individual neurons, but these same ideas could be applied perhaps to um, more macro scale brain imaging or activity as well. But really just this question of, okay, I can observe neurons in the brain while some behavior is taking place. And how do I form some sort of mapping or what we'll talk about are representations that allow us to go from this neural activity and then relate it to potentially complex behavior that an animal is carrying out, or even you know, human thinking about different concepts, how could we read out from the brain and, and decode um, that intention, movement, and, and complex behaviors. And um, as I'm sure a lot of you are uh, already aware, um, this question of, you know, how do we go from neural responses to some decoding of behavior has been a really challenging problem that we've been, you know, kind of going after um, now for decades as a, as a community. And what are some of the challenges that we faced in terms of this translation or forming these mappings? So, one of the kind of core challenges that we found is that, you know, if we just look at the firing of a, of a single neuron, even in response to the same stimulus, even if it's very simple, like here I'm showing an example of a visual stimulus that's just, you know, a drifting grading at some orientation. So the, the challenge is like you, you give the brain that same stimulus and you record from a neuron, but often its responses are highly variable. So this is really hard in terms of, using AI to form a mapping because we kind of have this stochastic relationship, if you will, between the stimulus that we want to decode and the actual neural firing. And so this is just a kind of schematic to um, highlight, let me see if I have my oh, cursor here. Okay, yeah. So just this idea that as we, you know, produce or introduce the same stimulus over and over, we might actually see very different neural responses from an individual neuron. And of course, you know, I'm talking now about a simple stimulus. So when we talk about complex behaviors, this becomes even more challenging. So one of the kind of insights and, you know, exciting um, new advances, you know, that have enabled a lot of the work moving forward is um, this understanding that if instead of looking at individual neurons and what they're doing, maybe if we look at populations of neurons kind of as this collective or distributed circuit or system, maybe it's possible to actually see far more stable responses if we view them at the population level than versus, you know, looking at individual neurons. And so this idea has been really nicely um, kind of characterized in the context of thinking about the firing rate of many neurons as being some sort of point in this high dimensional state space. And I know at least I looked through the, the slides from yesterday, you, you've already kind of gone through this state space view of neural populations. And then here just this is kind of showing, okay, well maybe individual neurons kind of look stochastic and not regular, but if we view them at a collective level, then we actually see that the same stimulus could have very kind of stable, robust fingerprints in, in this new space. 
So that, of course, motivates this idea that um, we can take populations of neurons and try to make sense of them by collectively looking at all of their responses. Um, but of course, you know, there's still a lot of challenges that we face in doing this. In particular, you know, maybe we can record from 100 neurons or maybe even as methods have scaled up thousands of neurons. But still, the, when you come back you know, day to day and record from the brain, the neurons that you actually have access to could be different. And it's also not clear if I get two neural recordings and they're from maybe the same neurons, um, it's often really challenging to know that there's exact correspondence between those neurons. So we're getting this sort of sampling of this population response, um, but there's still challenges in, in, in dealing with those data sets. So um, in my lab, we do a lot of work in tackling this type of general challenge through a number of different AI and deep learning um, paradigms. And in particular, we focus a lot on this question of representation learning. So from an unsupervised perspective, how do you take collections of neural activity and boil them down into something that is reflective of the behavior? And so learning representations, that's a core theme in the lab. And then we also are really interested in this question of comparison. So if I, have, if I look at the activity of two brains, or maybe it's the same brain over different time points or after learning, how do we actually make sense of like what's changed, what's the same, and um, compare those, those representations that we form? So, um, if anyone is interested in talking more about this question of comparison and alignment, we have a lot of work in that space and I'm happy to talk about it. I think I saw in one of the notebooks there was some, um, there was like a little exercise it's like you do PCA on one data set and then it was another and you see that you have these really similar representations but they've been kind of like shifted or they're not aligned. Is that correct? Okay. Anyways, I saw, I saw that. So it's like kind of similar to what we're talking about here that you know you might be able to form representations on different days or across different data sets. And there could be something common that's linking them, but our methods won't readily reveal that unless we actually go through the efforts of figuring out how to bring them into a sort of common latent space. Okay. Yeah, and this question of like subsets of neurons kind of giving different pictures um, is also kind of to the point that I was making about how when we're recording from the brain, we don't necessarily have access to exactly the same neurons at all time points and we'll get subsets of what we've uh, observed before. Any questions at this point? Feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, yeah. So. Right, so in this lecture, I'm gonna focus on some tools that we've been developing in this space of representation learning. Um, and so the goal here is to form, you know, um, to form this picture, right, or um, a manifold or representation of our neural data, but to do it in such a way where, you know, if we come back and we record basically from the same neural circuit, we would like to make sure that those representations do stay stable, right, and robust to any noise or other perturbations. And so, um, you know, this goal of forming robust representations is kind of the thing that I'll talk about and focus in on today. And then I've already highlighted some of the challenges about, you know, those, those neural activities maybe shifting over time or due to your measurement inadequacies and then um, you know in complex behaviors we often don't have true labels to guide the learning so a lot of this we would like to do in an unsupervised setting okay so that kind of motivates the general framework and what we're thinking about and then what I'll talk about today are um, a specific type of unsupervised learning called self-supervised learning or contrastive learning. I feel like self-supervised is a term that's used very widely. Like, Saber, you were referring to um, autoencoders as being self-supervised. That's kind of true, but it's, it's just, it's, I'll make it more clear what I, what I mean here. 
Yeah. And, and one that, you know, it's like some of this has come more from the computer vision literature, right? And so it's also just figuring out the right, <laughs> the right ways to use the methods rather than what they're called. Okay, so um, so we we heard yesterday about uh, LFADs, and we talked about this idea of um, auto encoders already as like an objective for doing unsupervised learning. And so, what do these generative or reconstruction based approaches aim to do? Um, they'll basically you know start with neural data, have some sort of embedding, or oh, I don't have your Sorry, I, ha I think I have it here. Oh, okay, yes. This is actually from Chathan's paper. <laughs> um, so yeah, you have a time series, neural recordings, maybe it's across trials, which we're showing here is like stacking across trials. Um, we're gonna form some sort of low dimensional or just some embedding of that data that we hope is going to align more with the generative factors that like truly give rise to the neural activity. And then the overall objective um, within a lot of these autoencoder frameworks is to form a high quality reconstruction of your original data. And so what that means is that we're going to have some sort of loss that tells us at the output how well we've done at recapitulating our, our data that we fed in at the input. Does that, that's all, okay. Any questions? Cool, so autoencoders are one example of that. You guys also might have heard about like generative adversarial networks or GANs, which are another form of generative modeling approach. And in this case, instead of, I mean, you're starting with um, input data, but instead of trying to reconstruct through this sort of mechanism, the GAN is trying to produce outputs that match the distribution of the input data. And here, the way that you actually create an example is a little different. You'll actually be in your latent space, generate like a random number, usually from a Gaussian, and then you, you push that random noise through the decoder to generate a new output. So that's sort of shown here. We have training set. We have some way of injecting some random noise into our latent space and then generating a given output. And then really what our what this mechanism here is trying to do is make sure that the distributions of the input and output match. And the GAN in particular will use a discriminator that tries to tell between real and fake data. And so you have these two networks that are trying to work together, one to try to trick this discriminator by creating more and more realistic data, and then the discriminator is trying to figure out you know, that it's been tricked or not. Okay, so um, we have, you know, in neuroscience, really benefited from both of these types of perspective as a way of you know, creating new neural data, and the hope is that we've captured some important latent factors that, that give rise to that generation. And so um, what I'll talk about today is a kind of alternative viewpoint. And it's based upon the observation that in many cases, um, if we train a generative model on one data set, it often will um, be very challenging to generalize onto a new data set. And this is a challenge that people have faced a lot also in computer vision with generative models that they can easily fit to noise in your original data set because it has to recapitulate everything. It has to reconstruct the full output. And so um, noise can be absorbed into that decoder and that output. In LFADs, they um, simplify the decoder so that's less likely to happen because you know, you're kind of going directly from your latent space. Um, but so this, but nonetheless, this motivation of building representations that will be highly generalizable and robust is something that you know we were excited to explore and go beyond these reconstruction-based approaches. And so, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. One uh, idea of the, the horizontal is to move the node. 
Right, right, right. Yeah, it has this kind of denoising um, it inherent in it. Yeah, so it is true that you know you're you're building a simpler or low, maybe low dimensional representation that has certain structure to it. Um, and so what that means is that you can only explain as much as those factors will tell you, right? But at the same time, when you're building this model, any structure and noise that's like specific to that data set, it can easily use that to still solve its reconstruction task. So it's not to say that you can't build, and maybe Chatham wants to jump in too, but it's not to say that you can't build a good autoencoder model that really is more honing in on those correct parts of your signal, but it's that autoencoders have this property where because they're using a reconstruction objective alone, there's nothing to guarantee that you won't pick up features that are very specific to your training data set. And for that reason, often when you try to use them on a slightly different data set, it doesn't actually um, build. From which one? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great, it, that's a great point. And that's something that both of our labs have been kind of pushing towards in terms of like, maybe there's something that's shared across many data sets or many animals, and that will be an even more useful refinement, I guess, of the data because there's something that's saying, okay, well, all these things have to be consistent and yeah. That's a, it's, a, it's a good point. And um, I think a lot of the motivation that I'm describing here is coming from the failure to generalize in a lot of other domains. And so these other type classes of approaches that I'll describe have a different way of going about doing unsupervised learning. And its goal is to try to form something that will be more stable and robust. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Regarding the noise question, I have exactly the same question. Will we be fair to say that if the noise is truly, for example, uh, we suggested with the truly very of noise where everything, like the random pixels, where uh, in an image where, you know, spectrum, right? But, but if the noise is... Uh, that's a good point, yes. Like, yes, yeah. yes, 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 like right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's actually a really great point, thank you. Um, so we're gonna form this loss function for reconstruction based upon assumptions that we have about what the noise structure is, right? So in LFADs, they're using like a Poisson link function and, you know, doing an estimate, estimation that's assuming Poisson noise. In an L2 objective, you're kind of implicit, or just using minimum, you know, least squares error, you're kind of implicitly assuming it's Gaussian noise, like that's the optimal thing to do if you have Gaussian noise. And so to your point, like the reconstruction objective is going to help denoise certain classes of signals, but if you have structured noise, the, the model wants to pick up on that because it seems to be sort of useful for its reconstruction. Yes, that's a great point. Okay, cool. So um, what I'll talk about is this kind of like alternative viewpoint, still using unsupervised frameworks as the kind of core um, aspect. But now what we're going to do is we're going to infuse some domain knowledge and some other pieces of information, but we're gonna do it still in a way where we don't assume we know the labels. Okay, and so how does this work? Um, so these are methods that are called like self-supervised learning or kind of based on contrastive learning ideas. And what do I mean by contrastive? So in one case I said, okay, I wanna take a data and I wanna reconstruct it. Right, And so that was my unsupervised learning objective to say, oh, if I do a good job of representing this, I should be able to reconstruct. Here, what we're going to do instead is basically find examples from our data set that should be similar to one another and more similar than anything else. And what we're going to try to do is um, build a representation that puts similar things, so in our case, brain states or populations of neurons that are firing in some way, it's going to try to put um, similar things into similar parts of the latent space. And so how do we define what we mean by similar? Um, 
There, so imagine if you had a supervised problem where you have pictures of cats and dogs, right? So one thing we could do if we have labels is we could take a picture of a cat and a picture of another cat, and we could say, okay, well, any pictures of cats should be closer to each other than pictures of dogs, right? Because we have some belief that if we want to solve like cats versus dogs, we should put all the cats in one place and all the dogs in another. And um, so if we had labels, we might be able to define this over different classes in our data. But when we don't have labels, what we do instead is we can rely on um, predefined and like user specified transformations of our input that will generate new examples that should be close to one another. And so what I mean by that is kind of shown in, in this picture here. Um, imagine I have a picture of a cat. I don't know it's a cat. But I do have in hand some different transformations of that image that will still produce something that looks cat-like. OK, obviously, in computer vision, we have a lot more priors that we can use. So um, in this case, like we could apply a transformation which just jitters the color channels. right? And now it's exactly the same cat in the same position, but now it's a different colored cat. And then here's another transformation, oops, which is um, a zoom and crop. So we took the same picture of the cat, and then we took, took a random position in space, and then we zoom in with a random amount of scaling. And so in both of these cases, it's like the same image, it's the same example, but we have these like really different views on that original data. Yes. Yeah, it's a it's like kind of the question <laughs> within this space because as you can see, um, the because we don't have labels, all of the structure and kind of the you know the core features of this representation are going to be induced by our choices of different augmentations, and so um, I think that's like a, a really interesting open question in general, even within computer vision and these other areas where this has been, you know, very popular and very widely used. It's still, we don't have like a strong handle on that. Um, but uh, one way that you could think about it is kind of more from an engineering perspective. So we could try different augmentations and then we could ask how well do those augmentations preserve some information that we want to decode, which is the approach that we initially took. Um, and, and in the context of neural data, you don't have like a zoom and crop. <laughs> so we'll get to that point. Um, but yeah, it's a really good question because um, there's a few different attributes and maybe we can talk more about this during the hands-on session too. And, and maybe I'm sure would be happy to help people with some of these ideas. Um, but, oh, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah. about the microphone there. Sorry. I kind of messed it up though. It was just really hot. Can you hear me okay? I think I messed it up. Oh, here we go. Is that okay? Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I will have an example later of how different augmentations can be used to like extract certain information, but then you might have other information that you kind of try to dissect from that. And so you could imagine using an augmentation to find a particular invariance but then still allowing yourself to maybe see what other invariances may exist. And I think your point about, you know, knowing about the part of the brain or what these neurons are trying to do is a, is a good idea in terms of, almost it might give you a way of 
of testing to see whether or not those invariances do truly exist within certain circuits. So yeah, it's a cool. I think that this could could give us kind of new ways of, of, of asking some of those questions. Okay, so yeah, so basically we'll define this class of transformations. It's a random procedure in the sense that like I'll get an example when I'm learning and I'm training within my batch and then I'll just randomly select, you know, two different augmentations of that particular example that gives me these two views. And then the goal of our learning objective is just to find or learn a set of weights or an encoder, which is parameterized here by F theta, that will project this data point to a point in our latent space and project this one. And then what we're gonna do is just try to minimize something like an L2 distance, or just a distance between those two views once they're embedded within our latent space. Does that make sense just as a kind of high level objective? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. So when I set it up, I was kind of more thinking about, okay, I have all these pictures of cats, and if I know the label, I could put them as positive examples of each other in terms of a class. Um, in this case, we'll only take one image, and we're creating all these possible views of it, and those are the thing now that we kind of use as this, um, as, as defining similarity. But then in the supervised case, when you would do it with pairing two cats, you would never pair a cat and a dog. However, it's an interesting question about, okay, if this, if this framework is very flexible and I can actually say that two things are similar or say, I could put a cat and a dog together and then the encoder should tell me fur or something, right? <laughs> or it should tell me something that is common and shared across the different examples. But the main thing is you just wanna keep it consistent. So if all of a sudden you put a cat with a dog, but it thought it needed to be learning the features of cats, then that could kind of make it harder to learn. But um, this is kind of, the objectives that are used here are related to um, basically just a form of um, mutual information maximization. And so this idea of finding the things that are common between two streams of data is very much kind of in line. So yeah, you could pair it in different ways. Yeah, so finding common information across these different augmentations or across the different streams of data that you're pairing. Okay, and so as we've already kind of discussed, great questions, um, you know, this, whole idea is going to be very dependent upon the choices of augmentations that are used. And so this can kind of make or break the performance of your learning algorithm. And so in, um, in computer vision, there's obviously a lot of domain knowledge that can be used to design very strong augmentations that won't change the information content in a, in a way where the label should be different. Um, so this is just some examples of maybe more extreme augmentations, like things like cutout are used often where it's just completely altering the distribution of the data at that point, right? Like I would never see this picture in nature, but this picture and this one, you know, do have the same main content in them. Um, people will use color distortions. Obviously if we do stuff like this, if we zoom in too far and we just had a picture of grass, then that might not be good, right? Because it's like, what's the common thing between, you know, this dog and grass? Well, it's probably the color, or it might be a kind of more superficial feature that's learned. Yeah, but like, it's like gray, or they'll put some sort of weird masking color here. But I, but I agree with you, it does build invariance to occlusion. That's kind of the idea, I guess, the idea behind what the cutout augmentation would do. But my argument is that this, if you looked at the distribution of this image in terms of its pixels, it would actually be kind of, it would be quite different, right, than a natural image. Cool. And then, you know, 
I'll, I'll just add to that, even if we're working in a different imaging domain, like medical imaging, the types of augmentations you would use would be different as well, because maybe in you know tumor differentiation, we need to care more about edges or certain aspects, like finer scale details in the data. So you wouldn't want to create extreme zoom crop augmentations, for instance, if you're working in medical imaging. And so this just kind of highlights this challenge of, you know, we are working with unsupervised data, but now we've kind of shifted a bit of the challenges towards how do we um, design good augmentations. And um, we were really interested in what this would look like in the context of neural population activity. So um, what I'll talk to you about is how we can think about the, using the same concept in what I motivated originally, which is building representations of neural population activity. Any more questions or any questions before I go into this next? The question yeah. Is it what? Um, it's a good, it's a good question. I kind of have this hypothesis that if you have a lot of data and you have like a, a deep network, you know, you have like capacity, it might be possible to add a lot of things and then like the network might be able to kind of learn the things that it wants to focus on more. Um, so what I haven't said is that when you apply these augmentations, like I said that it's random, right? But then it's also random and compositional. So meaning you have a list and then you have some probability of applying the first one and some prob probability of applying the second. And so when you go through the whole list, you could have many augmentations that have hit your image in the same case. And so I think that's what makes it a little challenging too, of like just adding everything because at some point it might actually hurt your good augmentations. But it's a... You can learn which That's a, yeah, that's an open question too. So recently there's been a lot of work in um, like using transformers with what, what's called like masked autoencoding. And it uses this kind of this kind of idea of just like cutting out parts of the data. And it seems like maybe like this type of augmentation when paired with certain learning algorithms could be kind of like universal and quite general. Um, right? Because you could cut out data from anything. Impute or the, was it? Cool. Nice. Yeah, so um, yeah, speaking of cutout, that's something that we use or, or dropout masking. Okay, so um, right, we're now kind of faced with this question of okay, we'd like to maybe leverage this idea in order to build more robust representations. What would be the sorts of augmentations that we would? introduced within neural data. And so there are kind of two main classes of augmentations that we started with because it's um, unlike, you know, images where we can do nice zoom and crop and stuff. Here we kind of, we have features, but we don't know which neurons are connected to each other. So we can't use some of those more sophisticated augmentations. So we started with kind of two main classes. Um, the first just being that coming from this assumption of, okay, if I have a population of neurons, they're doing something. And we talked already about you drop out some of those neurons, presumably the same information and same structure and content could be present within that new set of subsampled neurons, right? And so the first class of augmentations or like this idea of creating views is just basically taking an example where you'd have multiple neurons at a single point in time, right? And that's your kind of input. And then what we'll do to create another view is just basically mask out some random subset of the entries. So that's basically saying, okay, now tell me what is the common information experience 
by all of these different subsets of neurons that I provide you access to, right? So it's kind of, I mean, I think based upon the, the, the theory and kind of hypotheses, this makes a lot of sense um, for certain systems that have a lot of redundancy in terms of their neural code. And then in addition, we can also leverage the fact that, you know, as the brain is doing its thing, there is some stability. And so it's likely that two neighboring time points should also share some similarity. And so we can, we can use both this like dropout masking and we can also use temporal augmentations as a way to start building views and then feed this into the sorts of algorithms that I've talked about. And so this gives you both a temporal prediction task as well as like a neural com or population completion task. I think I'm close to the, oh, I have 15 minutes, okay. Okay, cool. So um, we started by applying these kind of simple classes of augmentations um, and then feeding them into some different self-supervised learning algorithms. So to start SimClear, SimCLR is a contrastive learning model. Um, and then Bile is another widely used um, loss function. That's what I showed before where you're basically just finding positive examples, and then minimizing the L2 distance in the projected latent space. Okay, so we do that, and then now we wanna say, okay, well, how good is our representation? Does it allow us to actually decode information of interest? And so that's what I'm showing in this example. Um, here, the, the task and the data is coming from, actually, Lee Miller's lab, um, where we have, we have friends, and um, so recording from primary motor cortex within um, macaques um, while they're doing just a simple center outreaching test. And so I'm just showing a picture of, you know, some kinematics that are generated while the animal is doing these different reaches towards these eight different targets. Um, and then we're recording from on the order of like hundreds of neurons. Um, we have data sets from two different animals and two different time points. And then the um, point here is like each time we're recording from the brain, we actually have completely different neurons. It has different dimensionality. So we're building a model for each of these data sets. Okay, form the representations. And then what do we do? We're going to freeze the neural network. So it's not gonna learn anymore. And then we're gonna project all of our data, which in this case is like neural firing rates over time. We're gonna project that into our, into the frozen network to form just representation. So we're kind of using it almost just as a feature extractor. We put all of our representations in, and then we're just going to train just a linear decoder on top of that representation, just to say how well can we predict the different reach directions. So what that means is that if we've done a good job of embedding our data so that neighboring reach directions or you know, kind of structurally things are more separable, then we should be able to solve this linear decoding task with high accuracy. But if things are kind of still non-linear and not well separated, then a linear readout is not going to be sufficient. Does that make sense? This is like a key way that um, these methods are evaluated. So we'll, we'll go through that in the hands-on notebook later. This idea of like a linear readout as a way of characterizing. Okay, so then what I'm showing here are the results on a Haldol data set um, when we do this procedure and then we try to decode the eight different reach directions. And um, here I'm just showing uh, a um, MLP, a multi-layer perceptron that's trained on the same task, but uses supervised data. So this model actually knows when data is coming from reach direction one or reach direction two, and it can use that to build just a supervised model. And then all these others are all unsupervised methods. And so the main takeaway here is that what we found is that even with these really simple dropout and temporal augmentations, we can actually outperform a supervised model that's trained with labels. And presumably it's also due to these issues that I talked about before, which is, you know, your neural network is gonna overfit to your training data. 
And even if you do regularization and all the tricks, when it's, when it's tested on a new data set, it might not actually do well at capturing the, the nuances of the new data set. And so what we find is that these unsupervised methods actually outperform a supervised decoder, which is kind of cool because it shows that some invariances that we've kind of cooked into this are already allowing us to get more robust brain decoding. Um, this is an autoencoder, and then this is like a, a Poisson variational autoencoder model that was um, kind of competitive with this as well. So we're comparing across the board here. Another, yeah. Kind of uh, no questions are silly. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, as a biologist, the first thing I would not see is how two is so much bigger than this. Is. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so I guess. Uh, the broader question is perhaps you can answer the specific here what's happening with TUI and why other coders don't work really as well for team than Niki. To make it broadly, like you know, these are actually some kind of expensive digital experiments in the sense, you know, people in the animal training, the animals, all that stuff, and how much of that is in a way you want to do it's driven by the animal and like you know, things that might be specific to the animal, but how broad are these things like, and yeah. Yeah, no, it's a really good observation for sure. Um, I don't have a I don't have a great answer for you in terms of um why. Uh Midi, so you you actually optimize or you okay, so in order to get the classes of augmentations at whatever proportion and all these things, right? Like we have optimized that on a held out training set. And I think that was on Chewy one. And then we use those same augmentations on all of the animals. So on one hand, like we've kind of maybe optimized this a bit more, but then those same augmentations do work very well for this other animal. But maybe you could argue that like there would be different sets of augmentations that could be more optimal for one or the other. And then the other thing that I haven't, I forgot that I didn't mention here is the task is a little bit different across the two of them um, in, the, in terms of the delay period. And so it also seems like, okay, so what are we doing? We're creating um, invariances over time by deciding that there's like um, a window of samples that should be kind of similar. And we fit, we have to fit that window, right? So it could be like 10 samples out, or maybe it's just two. And maybe the, the frequency and like how quickly the dynamics are changing actually should drive how how temporally regularized your representations are. I guess I'm just arguing more that there's probably differences that could be accommodated through different augmentations. And maybe through that, you would actually see going back to the other point of like, oh, this one needs like a longer window. And so that means that it's actually stable over longer chunks of time. I mean, I'm kind of, it's a little. <laughs> waving of hands. I will show, I think if I have time, I'll show you a result at the end that kind of um, shows that when we push this idea kind of further, or we, we actually have found there's quite a bit of generalization across animals, um, but it's using a kind of, kind of different framework. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to just do any generalization across animals because you just have different neurons. And so you have to figure out like, how do I make sense of both of these things? Uh, okay, cool. So, um, and in the kind of time that remains, I'm going to talk to you about a way that we um, went beyond these kind of simple classes of augmentation and tried to, you know, even further build robust representations. And, um, what I'm describing now is an algorithm called Mind Your Own View, uh, or Meow. And this is what we'll actually go through in the hands-on session. And so Mehdi, the first author of the work, is here. And you know, feel free to ask tons of questions. 
And, um, and so we can kind of go through this in more detail together. But what was the kind of motivation or idea behind Meow? Um, as I said, you know, we have these kind of nearby temporal um, ways of defining views or creating augmentations. Um, but we were really kind of interested in this idea that like, okay, nearby points in time might be similar, but there's other points in time where you experience similar brain states, right? So it's like, oh, I'm, you know, reaching towards whatever target. Um, so those nearby points in time in the same target, of course, are similar, but then there's other points in time where you're making a similar reach. Would there be some way of actually mining our data set and like finding those instances that are similar in terms of brain states and then actually um, bringing them together and building like invariances over time or other changes in like attentional modulation as well. So what I mean is like, I'm here, are there other windows, maybe not local to where I am, but that would still be good positive views to, to learn from. And this picture is just kind of showing this idea in terms of images. So, you know, we saw that we had a, an example, we could create a transformation of it based upon some pre-specified transformations. But what if we could find like another picture of a similar cute cat and then actually try to find the common structures that exist between them, but all without labels still. Cause we talked earlier about if I have labels, I can just find many pictures of cats. Okay, so we do that through um, basically trying to start learning with augmentations. And then what we're going to do is try to find maybe distant points in time, but that are being mapped to similar parts of our latent space. And through just like a simple nearest neighbor search, we can actually find some of those other instances of, uh, of, of similar nature. And so I think I have to press this twice, let me see. Yeah, okay. So as I'm showing here, right, like we kind of set this up in the standard framework so you can create augmentations of your original image. You're learning these encoder weights as we talked about before and projecting that data down into this latent space or low dimensional space. And um, at the same time, you're also taking all kinds of other candidate examples from your data set. And you can also plug those through your encoder. And essentially what we'll do is we'll find other points in time that are being mapped to similar parts of the latent space and use those as positive views or examples um, from which to learn from. And then a key part of this, oh, see, I just have problems with this. Nettie, I need to fix the video. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, so we'll do this latent space search. A another part of this is that in addition to doing this kind of local prediction, we're doing these non-local predictions and we actually do them in a slightly different part of our projector space. So it's sort of like the things that you learn from those local instances could be complementary, but slightly different from the things that you're learning across common instances over different points in time. And now when we um, you know, bring in Meow to the picture that we saw before, um, we can see that you know, across the board, Meow is improving over those other self-supervised learning algorithms, which is great news. And then in some cases where you know, we weren't hitting that level of the supervised decoder across the board, now Meow is like, at the level of or above um, the performance of the, of the supervised baselines. So now we can just see that, you know, temporal and dropout augmentations already provide like really strong um, invariances. And then we can kind of use this, this view mining mechanism to go even further and build more invariances in. We've also tested this um, in free behavior from, um, from rodents. And so this is just some results now applying the same ideas um, during free behavior to rat V1 and also hippocampus in the mouse. Um, here, we have started to dissect more of the complex behaviors using like video tracking and more sophisticated models. But at this point, we had a very coarse behavioral labels, which was just whether or not the animal was in REM, non-REM, or whether or not they were awake. 
And so now our learning algorithm could find all kinds of cool stuff, but then when we do the linear readout just to understand how well it's doing, we're just asking, can I tell the difference between REM, non-REM, and wake, which is actually a pretty coarse um, behavioral label. And we, again, find that just dropout as an augmentation actually works across many different brain areas. It's working in the mouse, the rat, and the monkey. So that just gave us some good um, proof of concept. And, and so, but then, you know, if you actually, you've learned all, you know, whatever we learned previously in terms of these kind of rich embeddings. And so, you know, even though our course labels are like, you know, wake, non-REM, and REM, which are these, you know, different colors that I've displayed here. This is just um, TSNI on the raw data, and then this is TSNI on applied to meow. So what we find is, you know, our, our labels are coarse, but there's a whole lot of cool stuff happening within these representations that can't necessarily just be described by the labels that we've given it. And so um, we have been, you know, digging deeper into the latent representations that are formed by this and starting to find some nice, like, complex behaviors that are actually kind of being um, illuminated through this approach. And um, so today you'll play a little bit with TensorBoard. I don't know if you guys have done that already, but this is like a nice plugin that Mehdi made in TensorBoard to, you know, you can pull out your latent representations. Um, zoom in on a cluster of interest. And then basically we can have a way of um, just like pulling out those video clips from those time points that it's identified as being linked within a cluster. And we have some more analysis here of like where they were in the cage and, and whatnot. But we don't have time to dig into this. Happy to talk more about these sorts of tools as a way for doing this kind of unbiased readout of complex behavior. We find more of these examples um, of both like motifs or little clusters that are both positionally linked and also kind of spread across position. This is hippocampus, so that kind of makes sense. And here are just some more examples. Okay, and any questions? Okay. Well, I'm sure people want to have their brain. Yes. I have a question on meow. Uh, so what do you, did you find, sort of, was it a point in time where you have similar illustrations uh, using the initial illustration that we generated? What do you do with that? What do you, sorry, when do you do it? What, what do you do with the initial data for different, different time points to set up your illustrations? Do you change the data that you're using that? <gasps> Oh, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I kind of, oh man, now I'm back on this slide again. Okay, I'm not gonna press play. <laughs> um, so yeah, I didn't go into all the details here, um, but the way that we have it set up is like you could potentially do the learning across both of those like streams of pairs kind of independently, so you'd have two latent spaces. Um, but the way that we do it is through a cascaded architecture. So basically, and, and we start actually from the beginning of training, introducing the nearest neighbors, but we have like a way of kind of ramping up the amount of gradients that are obtained from that. So, so basically, you know, at the beginning, you're kind of more relying on these local relationships, and then you start to um, incorporate more of the non-locality into your estimate. And then just to be very clear with your question, um, the original kind of bile architecture that this is built on top of will just do augmentations and then minimize, sorry. Um, so basically minimize the distance between the projected views within this first latent space. But what we do is we actually append another projector and predictor um, that is sequential, right? So you like first go through the augmented latent space, and then from that you go through this extra step where you're forming the, um, where you're basically trying to minimize the difference between the non-local views. So we still, in all of these cases, we're still using the same representation layer, like we're always pulling from the output here. But the algorithm has these kind of 
secondary stages for which it can build these two kind of different ways of pulling the data together. And does that answer your question? Yeah. Why do you to use the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all I'm saying is that they're going to go through the same architecture. They're going to hit the same latent space, but they're going to go just one step further and just the augmented views kind of stop at this first project projector predictor. So yeah, we're feeding them in. We're feeding them through the same like loop and set of different networks. Um, but we're accumulating or like uh, measuring the loss across the two different types of views separately. I think I, we might have some better, yeah. Um, happy to go into more of those details later. I didn't have the, the loss function here, but it's just a, a combination of like the augmented loss term plus some scalar times the, the view mine loss term. So it's just a combination of both. Yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, was, I was describing this idea of like this linear readout, right? And it's on the test data. So we've, we've trained on our training. We've, we've fit all the weights of our model. We freeze it, we plug it through, and then we try to decode on test, or, and then we train that model on our training data too, like the linear readout. And then on test data, we're asking how well can we predict the variables that we want to decode. So here there's three classes. So you get 100% if on your test data, you could on every single sample predict whether it's wake, non-rem, or rem. And then on the previous example, there were eight different classes. So 100% would be I always can predict which reach direction. Oh, so our collaborators, um, like they, they do a lot of studies in sleep, and so they have um, ways of measuring from the LFP. They can classify it into REM. Oh, maybe your point is that, like, you know, there is some human or someone who has annotated this data and said this is the ground truth, but maybe it's not actually the ground truth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that could that could certainly. Yeah. Yeah, so the main errors that come in this classification often come like just at the boundary when the animal's like going into REM or non-REM or you know, so there there can be a kind of small window over which the human annotator might give you a different answer. So yeah, I mean, I think for these data sets, they've had multiple annotations. You know what I mean? Like they've done a good job of trying to do it to the best of their ability. But yeah, you're right. If there's like inner rate of reliability is 90%, then that's your 100%, right? That's what I'm asking. Then we learn, like, even in the data from pure data, it tells me, like, why it's just better annotated. So, like, you said, you can go back to the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we have a recent paper with, with their team that basically uses like a neural network to be able to get even finer resolution of those boundaries. And they have shown there is some discrepancy um, between what humans would do and what the best automated approach might give. But yes, this is always a, <laughs> we're like using humans to, to evaluate this. Um, obviously, yeah, with the monkey case, it's more clean, right? You know exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, 
So I guess I'll say for the for the case of the REM, non REM, like those labels, I would say that um, that's not what we actually care about in the end. So it's kind of more just like a coarser readout to help optimize things and like, okay, we're kind of doing something sensible. And then as you said, there's actually all this other stuff in there. We don't have labels over, so we can't use the same procedure for saying whether or not, but but there are other tools for like doing unsupervised representation, like quality evaluation that perhaps could be leveraged in that case where you start seeing, you know, really nicely um, separated clusters, but happy to talk more um, later. And then, um, so we've, you know, uh, after developing Meow and showing how SSL and augmentations can be used in neural data, we've kind of gone um, forward and, and applied some, some new variants to this that kind of help in, in different ways. And so I kind of alluded to this earlier. This is now um, using the self-supervised learning framework, but also combining it with a generative model, which I said before, was used to kind of reconstruct the data. And so going back to um, the question earlier about like, oh, some augmentations can tell you one thing, this allows us to actually um, both, so our goal here is to learn a representation and in part of our representation space, this content space, we'll do what I described before, which is defining augmentations and finding this nice kind of robust representation. Um, and then we append or we give another set of variables to the model that allow it to then, using both the set of content variables and these, res these additional variables, um, the objective is actually to generate or reconstruct. So what that means is that our representation is formed using these different invariant strategies, and then we can actually allow the model to also reconstruct by appending some additional set of latent variables. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get nice representations, but then you can also generate data. And then to the point earlier, um, what we find is that, you know, what's embedded within the SSL representation is a very kind of, structured picture of the direction of the reaches because we've kind of become more invariant to time. So like when we define those nearby points in time as being neighbors, it makes us more invariant to, sh to small deviations in time, which also means that we kind of take away some of the dynamics in our representation when we learn. And so what's cool is if you combine both perspectives, you can both get a good representation of where you're going as well as the dynamics or the structure to get there. And so what we found is that this does a kind of, it does a good job of disentangling um, content from dynamics through this kind of um, multi-representation component. So this is a way of doing disentanglement and kind of combining generative modeling with um, contrastive learning. Okay, so, and I had just like, I could show one thing at the end that had to do with your question about generalization, just because it's like a, a new paper under review. Um, but I'll go ahead and just summarize what we've talked about so far. So, um, you know, I spent quite a bit of time just motivating this idea of using augmentation-based learning. Um, I talked about mind your own view or meow, which we'll see later. Um, some takeaways were, you know, that we could um, use kind of general classes of augmentations across many different brain areas and in different organisms. Um, and then, you know, by adding this non-local element, kind of go even further to get robustness. And then in the very last part, I was just talking about this model called SWAP VAE, which basically combines the self-supervised learning with a generative modeling framework. And we can show, you can get some disentanglement of like content from dynamics using this approach. Just one more minute. Okay, and so then just kind of quickly, I'll give you a little bit of flavor of some new stuff that we've been doing that really helps towards this generalization perspective. Um, and also happy to talk about this. Um, so yeah, this is just on archive. Uh, basically, what we've been able to do is, I think, really cool. 
So, okay, so we've been talking about this idea where like I have all these neurons and they're a population and then they're gonna go into some encoder or some model and collectively we're forming a representation of all of them jointly. But what we said is that this can be problematic because if I have new neurons, I don't actually, I'd have to completely retrain everything because it doesn't have the ability to use the structure that it's learned in this new set of neural activities. And so we have recently developed like a transformer based architecture that allows us to um, actually train on one individual and then use that model on another set of neurons that don't have any correspondence. So what we do is we can pass in like a chunk of time or some time series of spiking activity. And what our model does initially is it forms an embedding of every neuron. So you plug in a neuron and you get a representation and it's one model. So now you plug in a new neuron, get a representation and you keep on doing this. Say you have a hundred neurons to start, you would form a hundred representations of all those neurons. And then you just stack them together. So you concatenate all hundred representations. And then, um, and then from that in our, in our main model, like we'll do an embedding in time, and then we learn a transformer layer, which tells you how to like combine representations across all those hundred neurons. So you'll have like all of your feature vectors for the neurons, and then the second transformer, which is a spatial transformer, will figure out how to how to relate different neurons that are all kind of in that in that space. And so we have this two-stage uh, transformer, one that works on time and the other that works in space, meaning neuronal space. And we can train this, this is all supervised in this case. So we can train it on some of the tasks that we've described. Um, and then what's really cool is the ability to generalize. So now because we've learned a way of forming representations of each neuron, um, we can now plug in data from a completely different animal, a completely different time point. They don't have to have the same neurons, but we can still just plug them in, right? And now we get a new representation for this new animal and we can concatenate them again. We can't use the second half of our transformer because it was specific for the first one that we learned on. Like it needs a hundred neurons. This other one might have 20 neurons. So now we just create this new um, embedding vector and we can learn with a linear layer. So just retrain a linear layer to be able to decode. And so what this is showing is basically with our model, if we train on one animal, we can then test on two other individuals and we can actually do a very good job of decoding neural activity through this completely like separated architecture, which means that we can use a lot of data from other individuals, we can train a model, and then we can still use it on a completely different data set. So this is um, hot off the press, and um, you know we're really excited about the possibility of by like decoupling learning so you have independent representations as well as population level representations. This can actually give us new insights into functional properties of different neurons and hopefully we'll be able to see more clearly how neurons are interacting to generate population states. Um, and so, yeah. So I'll go ahead and stop. Um, Mehdi also has this really cool new result that we just posted on BioArchive like yesterday um, in determining cell types from spiking data of in vivo um, calcium imaging and also electrophys, and so this will be in the slides, so you can check some of this out. Um, and then of course, just all the people that made this happen. So Mehdi is here, please pick his brain. Um, other folks in the lab that you know played important roles in this work, including Rand, talked about some of her work at the end. And then our collaborators in the Hangin Lab um, and at DeepMind and Johns Hopkins. So it's been a, a, a big effort to, to bring all this together. And um, yeah. So that's it. Thank you.